Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery programming series for our current show, A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023, a collaboration with the Ohio Advisory Group of the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. Today, we are thrilled to present the artist, Sharon Kolblinger. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. Please feel free to utilize that chat function to ask questions, and we'll be sure to get to them during the Q&A portion of the hour. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, thanks all and welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much. And thank you for organizing Kat and everyone at Rife Gallery. Um, I really appreciate being a part of this show and giving them the opportunity to share my work. Um, so I begin with actually the end of my undergraduate career. Um, I had majored in sculpture in undergrad and perhaps in a way that was like my own way of not being able to like be pinned down on any particular media. I wanted to explore a lot of different types of media at the time. And um, what I kind of found as I progressed through my undergraduate career was an increasing frustration with um, perhaps the medium of sculpture itself, because what was happening was I was starting to do performances and installations and they would they wouldn't last. And so um, I would ultimately document my installations and performances through photographs. And at some point I felt as though people were seeing the documentation and the photographs more than they were actually seeing the piece. And it was at this point that I decided to turn my attention to photography because I was like, well, if everyone's just seeing the documentation, maybe I should make the photographs the work. Um, so what you're seeing here was kind of that turning point for me. It was one of my last performances that I did um, where I had placed my hands on the glass and, and it stretched as, as far as I could um, to kind of test the limitations of my body. Um, so after this point, I started to look at a lot of photographers and I became really interested in Brancusi's photographs. Brancusi also being a sculptor who used photography. And what inspired me so much about his work was that um, he wanted the photograph to be more than just a document. He wanted it to um, have a physical presence as well. So oftentimes his photographs were intentionally blown out or there were um, surface scratches on the actual photograph itself to emphasize the object quality of the image. And so Brancusi became a really major influence early on when I started to explore photography because I was very much so trying to push back on the document, the documentation element of photography itself, because that was in a sense one of the things that in a way frustrated me about documenting my sculptures and installations and performances. I moved to North Philadelphia to attend grad school. Um, and it was I think, a, you know, a, certainly a very different environment than what I had been used to in Minneapolis. Um, there, Philadelphia admittedly has like a reputation for being one of the most littered cities in the U.S. And I actually started to find that litter to be inspirational um, and very curious at just the way that like, you know, th these are just two examples the way that like I would find a traffic cone on the street that someone had like taken a, a blade to and cut open and so it's like no longer can stand erect it's totally rendered useless or um seeing like this pile of books on, on the street but then this like beautiful cover of this like cloud sunset on one of the covers um it just I, I really was interested in kind of the irony and the duality of purpose in what I was finding um, on my daily bike rides between my house and my studio at school. So I decided to harness that in my work. And this was my first kind of like major body of photographic work um, that I had explored. And I photographed things that I had found on the streets in Philly. 
So all of the materials that I, or I should say most of the materials that I was using was um, either picked up off the streets on my bike rides or, um, you know, it's kind of scraps that I had found from around the studio. So I was very much so a scavenger at this point in my life. And I was interested in not necessarily revealing what it was that I was in fact photographing um, and instead kind of almost creating an alchemy so that um, viewers could really sink into maybe the like mystique of this like black ribbon that is like simultaneously opaque, but then also reflective as well. Um, at this point in my career, I feel fine naming what these objects were. This was um, the VHS cassette tape from a, a VHS cassette that I had found on the street. So that was the material itself. And in thinking about presentation, I tried to make the presentation reflect the actual image as much as possible. And so in this case, I had mounted this image on one half inch thick plexiglass to emulate the like the quality of the black ribbon in the photograph. Um, so it's very much so like I, I can never fully step away from sculpture as much as it frustrated me in documentation. I really still wanted my photos to exist and live in the present. Um, similarly here, we, you know, have like a marred piece of steel that I had found, um, spray painted paper that um, had been used to mask off something that I had been painting in the studio um, and kind of a plastic um, iridescent ribbon. So I was kind of interested in making things that referred to spaces and felt maybe familiar, but weren't necessarily entirely legible as well. Um, references to the landscape um, and, and kind of like, I think a little bit like tactile textures that you want to touch. This was a window screen that I had found on the street along with um, some charcoal powder that I had um, sprinkled over a piece of fabric that I had also found. Um, and in displaying these works, they were mounted onto aluminum and I kind of wanted to create like a push and pull of space a little bit. So I intentionally installed this piece in the foreground at an angle. Um, the whole photograph kind of almost recedes in space, but then installing at an angle, pushing forward towards the viewer, um, created a little bit of like, um, like a, like a little bit of like, you know, not quite understanding like what's happening in space. Is it advancing towards you? Is it receding back? And I'm kind of just like interested in a little bit of that play with the viewer of like making them start to feel perhaps even a little uncomfortable um, in their presence in front of the photograph. This is um, another one, you know, where again, the photograph is really addressing the wall. I think all of these images are really like addressing the wall is like not just a space to hang the work, but also like something to react against. Um, this was just a piece of velvet and it's, it admittedly doesn't get reproduced very well digitally and on a small screen. It was a quite, quite a large photograph, um, but there was like a shimmery quality to the velvet that looked like a galaxy. Um, and then finally, this piece here was is actually quite large. It's about 90 inches wide. And unfortunately, I don't have a to scale version with like a person in it. Um, but it was quite large and, you know, it was mounted directly onto the wall so that there wasn't any space between the photograph and the wall itself. Um, so it almost seemed as though it was like a cutout in the wall and that a viewer could like step in to this space. Um, so it like was very much so like a visceral um, body like response that viewers would have to this work. And though of course this is all very much so different in terms of the approach um, that I have you know, with my work up at the gallery right now, I think you can kind of start to see like where some of these like initial impulses are beginning um, in this work that I had done in grad school. 
Um, after grad school, I spent a lot of time just kind of reprocessing and looking at work. And one of the pieces I had seen during those like first two years out of grad school was this work by Giuseppe. Pannone um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And what he had done here was he had pulled a rock, which is seen on the right, and he carved an exact replica of that rock on the left. And so I became really interested in this notion of like sculptural reproduction. It's a lot like photography in the sense, and a lot like that idea of like reproducing of one thing gets back to my like frustration with the document in a sense. And when I say frustration, it's kind of like something I'm always constantly pushing back against, but at the same time embracing because I wouldn't be able to create my work without that. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of a complicated relationship I have. And so this piece became really inspiring. And this really led me to my next body of work in um, this series called me uh, a scar is a question mark and during my time in grad school when I was producing the last body of work I was just showing my father had passed away after battling cancer for 10 years and he had actually battled brain tumors almost all my life and the title refers to the shape of the scar that he had had on his head after his first brain surgery when I was seven and I remember seeing it for the first time and thinking that it looked like my, my first thought as a child was that it looked like a question mark, the shape of his incision. So I kind of kept that in mind with this work in the sense of like, what is a question mark? Um, you know, how and what is a scar, right? Like something that's maybe permanent, but then something that is open ended as well. And so I was really interested in pushing against those dualities in this work. Um, the work was all installed at like floor level. And so what had to happen was the viewer would walk into the space and be viewing the work with eyes downcast. And so I was interested in recreating maybe just like a little bit of like an internal reflection as well as a sense of mourning in the actual viewing of the work. And so you can see here um, some of the like inspiration from Giuseppe Pannone's work right here in that I was recreating some um, kind of more common everyday materials, but then in subversive ways. Um, so this was a four leaf clover, but it was actually pressed out of lead. And so I was interested in that duality of like, you know, something that's known for luck, but at the same time is made out of something toxic. This was the piece that kind of anchored the whole room. It was a Greek funerary statue that I'd photographed um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, I had rubbed graphite powder onto the surface of this photograph. So it kind of marred and obscured parts of the photograph. Well, at the same time, like I masked off a circle in the center, kind of like emphasizing this sculpture's face a little bit and getting to this kind of like, as cheesy as it sounds, this kind of like, uh, you know, metaphor of like the circle of life. And it was mounted as on steel, as an object to just set onto the floor. Um, this was um, a sculpture and it was a hundred pieces of hand-drawn graph paper. Um, so it, there's like a certain level of precision in like trying to recreate faithfully this um, architectural graph paper, but then at the same time, um, there was many kind of errors and mistakes of my own hand during the construction of that. And so that like simultaneously gets revealed as well. I created a pedestal then the shape of a cube to kind of like reinforce the structure of that graph paper. And then the last piece in the show was this cinder block brick that I had cast into small, it was I think one inch fragments. Um, I kind of always refer to it as like if you took a cinder block and sent it through a bread slicer, though um, each bit was um, individually cast. 
And I was kind of like, you know, it was called my brick for your bread. And it was referring to my father's struggles with both his um, illness and cancer treatment and how that ultimately got in the way of his ability to provide for his family. Um, it was really a show that like I had to get on my system and work out. My dad was such a huge influence on me and his loss was such a blow. And um, this, I, I would say that this show like was a lot of personal processing and, and really like personal motivation to do it. Um, and it kind of like after this, I can't, after I kind of like worked a lot of this stuff out, then I, my work started to kind of like take on a little bit of another form. Um, and so I, I, again, had to do a lot of experimentation um, to get to that next level. And I, this is um, a postcard that I keep in my studio um, just to remind me that I need to trust the process because sometimes the process can take many years of like tests and then failures before I can kind of land on something that's really working. And art can be so frustrating and so like such an emotional roller coaster. And so um, I kind of, I keep this postcard to be able to just like, I, it's like my motivational postcard. <laughs> It's like my version of the like the cat hanging their postcard that like, you know, it's okay when doing something, it seems like a futile nature and, um, you know, that it, the work that you are doing is ultimately going to lead to something. And if it doesn't, it's okay too. Um, so this is maybe part to that point. Um, I took a ceramics class after I had completed that previous show. And this was my first night in the ceramics class. We were doing just really simple pinch pots. And the pinch pot on the far left was my first pinch pot of the night. Pinch pot on the far right was my last pinch pot of the night. Um, and so I was actually like pretty proud in terms of like the progress I had made it just in that one night. And it also it, like serves as this reminder to, to like try new things and to like continue to hone my craft a little bit. Around this time too, I um, had, oh, I had always been a big fan of Robert Mablethorpe's photographs, um, but I took a trip to the Guggenheim and discovered that he had also created these sculptural frames, which I've never known before. And this likewise served as inspiration because, you know, again, here's a photographer who's addressing the presentation in a sculptural way. So it really piqued my interest. So kind of combining both of those things together, I started to try to make my own frames out of um, black porcelain. And at first they were, you know, pretty standard, right? I'm, I was kind of thinking about pushing against the wall and like, you know, making my frames come out in space, but I was still very much still working with like the stando, standard window format of the frame. And um, so these are some early experimentations, pre-fired experimentations um, of that work. And ultimately they were always so clunky and um, I think, you know, in my very naive way of not being a ceramicist, I really, really thought that I could make black porcelain work. Um, but ultimately, like, I guess porcelain's really finicky and warps a lot. So um, I ended up with a lot of kind of misshapen and weird, you know, unintended um, uh, ceramic frames that never quite worked the way I wanted it to. Um, so this was all of a sudden like six months of experimentation that seemingly went nowhere initially um, that I eventually had to drop because I had the pressure of an impending show. Um, so I'm frantically trying to come up with some kind of a presentation method for um, the new photographs I'd been making at the time. And this was another kind of like dead end, so to speak, in that um, I bought these like huge full length Ikea mirrors and I was like putting my photographs on top of the mirrors. And I was, cause I was trying to think about how to address the viewer in a more overt way. 
And ultimately it was just so distracting because, you know, obviously like the, your own feet were just so visible when um, looking at the photographs. And so that became very distracting visually. And so this wasn't working out either. Um, and I was kind of really flailing at the time in terms of like, what am I doing? Like, like, I think my show is like within three months or something. Like I, you know, this is again, like <laughs> sometimes something doing something leads to nothing. Um, but ultimately there's always something that eventually clicks. And, um, I had taken my students to an exhibition at the International Center for Photography, um, public private secret that was curated by, by Charlotte Cotton. And I, you know, looked over while they were off, you know, having their own viewing experiences. And I noticed a bunch of my students crowding around, interacting with this one piece. And they were all very engaged. And I was like, very curious about that. And so when I went up to look myself, I discovered that um, it was really just a series of Polaroids and, you know, that were covered up by like a wool um, a fabric covering to protect them from light, you know, so it was purely functional. But this, I think, kind of sparked something in me in like, like thinking about that kind of like hiding a photograph from direct view and creating a situation where the viewer has to interact with it if they want to see it. So it kind of like all of those things working in tandem, the like ceramic frames, the mirrors, the like hiding the photograph from the viewer, all finally like coalesced into um, this body of work um, in the city, you forget to look at the sky. And it just to like explain briefly the like structure of this um, kind of like viewing frame, because it's, I, I always think it's again, a little bit hard to document to fully understand um, what's happening is that I um, created a steel box and on the opposite, side of this steel front facing the wall is a photograph which is what you see on the far right inside the steel box facing the viewer is a mirror and that mirror reflects the photograph that is facing the wall so the viewer is never actually able to fully look at the photograph itself printed on paper they can only see its reflection in the mirror um, and you can kind of see in the center photograph, a small reflection of the viewer's eyes um, as they're knelt down to be able to look through this like people that I've created to see the um, photograph. Um, the mirror is a first surface mirror, which essentially means that the reflective surface is on the front of the glass rather than behind the glass and that just became really important to me for clarity um, when the reflective surface is behind the glass it can um, create like a little bit of a double edge or image because you're seeing through the glass at an angle um, so this kind of maximized clarity um, by using this specialty mirror it's incidentally also the kind of mirror that ooh, sorry the kind of mirror that um, telescopes are used used to like peer into space. So I kind of like that connection as well. Um, so this kind of like gave me this opportunity to very slyly um, encourage the viewer to move about the images. But at the same time, I'm really very interested in giving them moments of engagement where like they're confronted with their own act of viewing through their reflections in the mirrors. This is actually to explain this photo because it's a little bit um, obtuse. This was a photo taken um, during the eclipse in, uh, what was it, 2017 or so? Um, and what happened was that like the eclipse, what was happening actually reflected through the camera lens. And like, you can see the eclipse kind of like right there is almost like a sun flare in the lens. So I kind of, like those like very like small detail moments of um, alchemy in a way that that happen. Um, here's just a kind of picture of one of the installation walls and 
what I really want to do is like move the viewer's um, body around these frames. Like none of the photographs are actually viewable in full from any one point of view. Like you must move around them to or in order to piece the whole image together. Here's another one, it kind of showed that center one shows that mirror a little bit more clearly. Um, and these are like a lot of just like, you know, kind of like scenes that were um, kind of more casually observed. Um, I had done a residency around that time and in talking through one of, in talking through this project with one of the other residents, um, they encouraged me not to overthink the photographs because like the sculptural elements, it became so complex. Um, so I kept the photographs relatively simple. I was really just interested in passing moments, um, things that maybe like scenes that also maybe aren't seen in full in the image, but you know maybe you have to um, operate underneath a certain gestalt and like fill in some of the gaps in the image itself as well. Here's another one. They can be, you know, they range from that street scene to like a more domestic scene as well with shadows projected onto the wall. Really, I was just kind of interested in little ephemeral moments in life um, and how I could express those through photography. Here's um, an installation image of, you know, a part of the gallery. Um, in addition to the frames, I still wanted to include sculpture. I can't, I can't ever quite make my way, um, you know, fully away from sculpture. Um, it is, I think, such an interesting way to like anchor a space. And so, for this particular project, um, I had created this comb, this like double-sided comb, out of um, a soft silicone, and. Um, I then also created this like my own pedestal as well that kind of like was bent on one side to react and respond to the like links between the two cones um, as it was resting on the pedestal and then have that mirror surface to again link it to the photographs and, and the frames themselves. It was inspired by a comb I'd seen at the Cleveland Museum of Art and in French, the comb said, my judgment, and then on the other side, for your comfort. And I thought that that was such an odd thing. Um, and yeah, I was really drawn to it because of, again, those dualities that I've kind of always been interested in. Um, and so I really was like, I kind of that hung in my head a lot. And so I really wanted to kind of make my own version of this comb. So this comb is very much in response to that um, piece of the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, again, just in terms of the process, it starts off so crude. And, and ultimately, like I try to work with the most uh, cost efficient materials when trying to like figure out my you know approach here because there are so many failures. Um, and so like it's really started out with just a couple combs I found at Sally Beauty Supply and I was like linking them with like fabric I had in my studio um, and trying to like figure out like what what the like outcome would ultimately look like before I had to spend the money on the more expensive combs and the more expensive materials. Um, so I did buy some uh, combs that I thought kind of like visually matched one another and then threaded them together with a leather cord and um, the tines on the right, there was like a lot more than the tines on the left. So I had to solve like how to start to link them together a little bit so that they could all create like one fluid um, connection in the sculptural piece. And then I poured a silicone mold making material over these combs and leather cord in order to create a mold that I cast into this resin. Um, and so this was actually just like pulled right out of the mold. So it's just all in all its messy glory um, with a lot of excess material around all of the individual tines. But this was, this was actually the first one that I pulled and I was just so excited that it had worked. Um, but then ultimately it was a lot of cleanup to go in with an exacto blade and like cut out all of that um, excess resin. 
Um, this is just some like of my process in terms of photographing. This was one of the images in the show. And it's just, I mean, a lot, a lot of photographing, a lot, a lot of options. Um, I always like my, my philosophy is to always take a lot more photographs than I ever think I'll need because, um, it's much harder to go back and reshoot than it is to, you know, take more photos in the spot. So my catalogs are extensive and take up tons of space on my computer. And then um, this is what some of the like early versions um, as I was kind of like mocking up the shapes and the, combina the combination of the shapes and the photos together in the studio for those frames. Um, I just really used like cheap um, poster board and like uh, this was like a, just a cheap craft mirror and you can even see like I literally taped it onto the wall with packing tape like it's very crude uh, but it allows me to work through ideas quickly and very affordably um, before ultimately then I put the me the measurements and the specs into a document. Um, I've had to learn a little bit of CAD in order to create um, these cutouts for the steel frames. And the first project, um, I actually worked with a fabricator who did all the cutting and bending for me. Um, so I had to be very specific with the specs in, in providing that to him. So this kind of seemed like a natural evolution for this body of work that's currently up at Rife right now. Um, in moving to this next project, there were a few things that I really wanted to hit on um, to kind of like make this project perhaps stand out a little bit more um, from the previous project and also give myself the opportunity to explore some new challenges. Um, the first First thing, kind of one of the most major was working in color, which is something that a lot of my friends have teased me for a while that I wasn't doing. Um, I was primarily like either working within a very limited color palette or just strictly black and white. Um, and so I think, you know, at this point we were early in the pandemic and I was really, I think probably just the like coalescence of like feeling like a little bit more trapped physically made me want to brand out more artistically and so um, I started to work in color um, for this particular project and this first work is really the impetus for the whole series um, photographically speaking I should say because um, I was this was probably June 2020 sitting on my front porch eating lunch and I looked over at my neighbor's house and I saw her watering her plant and I thought it was just so odd you know it's, it's still this new world that we were in where like I hadn't had any close contact with my neighbor in several months and really like all I had seen of her was like this kind of like severed arm coming out from her fence to just like water this like flowering bush and I was just like, this is so surreal, but so inspiring. Like I was just like eating my lunch and just like couldn't stop like watching her water her plant. It was just kind of like this, one of those moments where again, things just started like clicking. So it really like spawned the next photo project for me. And what I ended up doing was rather than like asking her to pose for me, um, I actually recreated that moment myself. So it was kind of, again, like it, it kind of, to me, like served as this idea of like, you know, um, thwarting the like document a little bit. It was also this like in recreating, it kind of increased this distance still that I was feeling between myself and other people. Um, and so that's, you know, just in terms of like, yeah, that was my approach with this image and like why it was so inspiring. Um, the forms became a little bit more overt in the actual like frames that they like folded out and you could like see some of the photograph that was um, on the other side of that metal. So in a sense, it kind of revealed more, but it only strategically revealed more about the photo um, ultimately you still had to like move around the image in order to see the, um, in order to see the whole picture. But it just, they more so served as like teases. Um, you know, I'm always like really interested in like kind of like the artificial and the natural world. And so in this case, like I had purchased a like 
uh, kind of a camouflage leafy type jacket um, to be worn in front of a, like a wall of, of leaves. And so I was kind of like interested in the body almost like disappearing into nature a little bit there. And then there's just kind of like this little bit of like an, a curveball thrown in with um, that chicken. My stepdaughter had been chicken sitting during um, a couple of weeks during the pandemic. And so I was able to go over and spend some time with these little animals. Um, again, you know, just like interested in like viewing people from a distance, um, you know, not being able to uh, truly understand their entire identity or like what perhaps they're, they're kind of going through by not seeing their faces. So that's what I was kind of thinking about in this particular photo. It's like certainly this moment of almost like contemplation in front of this um, home fire pit. Um, let's see. And, you know, again, to just like bodies being hidden by like some of the like everyday chores around the house um, that I would see like my, my other neighbor, Tom, is like the guy, the guy who's got like a leaf blower and always some project going on. Um, and so this is inspired by like what I was observing over in his yard as well. And then I believe this is the last one. Um, so again, just like some like moments of like, kind of like refuge and calm, but then also there's just like a little bit of a psychological loneliness, I think, to the work as well. Um, they all very much so, like with some greater distance now at this point, they all very much so feel like pandemic works to me at this point, um, because they they do all like, and, embody that kind of like a um, little bit of like contemplative loneliness. Um, this was the work installed in the show and I like to install my work with a lot of space around it so that it really gives viewers the opportunity to freely move around the works. Um, I kind of like this image on the far left and how like um, the viewer is actually like kicking up her like foot a little bit in order to like gain a little bit of height to see in through one of the peepholes or, you know, to like really crouch down um, to see up into um, the photograph. So again, I'm still very much so interested in like trying to get that viewer to physically engage as much as possible with the work. In terms of the process for this one, um, this was my wall when I was coming up with all of those shapes. Um, I really just like, I sat down actually with a book of like mid-century wallpaper designs um, as inspiration. And then I just started interpreting those shapes that I'd seen in the designs. And I just kept cutting out, like just, it was just my exacto blade and these little kind of like three by four inch, you know, sheets of, um, cardstock in order to explore a lot, a lot of possibilities. Um, and so here's some of those up close. And I don't think that any of these actually made the cut in my work. Um, but, but, you know, again, it's all part of the process. Sometimes doing something leads to nothing. Um, this is the process of photographing that one image we saw earlier with the, um, the hair being threaded through the lawn chair. Um, this is really what it kind of looks like in real time. Um, and I always say that, like, I show this photograph just to, like, also demonstrate that I have people that love me very much and are willing to put up with very awkward and uncomfortable positions for lengths of time that it takes for the photograph to be taken. Um, so my stepdaughter had posed for me for this one, um, and she was a very good sport. This is, um, sometimes people are kind of interested in the technology element. Um, the first project I had collaborated with a fabricator who had cut and bent all my work, but this time around I actually had access to a water jet cutter. Um, and so I was able to do the cutting myself with the assistance of someone who could professionally run the water jet. Um, and so I took a very short, it's about 20 second video, I think. So I thought I'd share it with you all. It's 
So it's really just a very concentrated um, jet of water that is strong enough to, I think, cut up to like a half an inch thick of steel. Um, ultimately, mine was about an eighth inch, um, but it's it's really I mean, kind of impressive in terms of like the strength and the power of this machine um, to be able to so effortlessly cut through metal. So I would, you know, design my files in Illustrator and transfer them to a CAD program to be interpreted. And um, ultimately, then um, that CAD program would send the information to this water jet in order to create these cuts. There we go. Sorry. Um, and then um, I also bent all of the metal myself as well. Um, I'd had a friend who who had a break, and so I was able to um, to do all the bending myself too. So this kind of it was like a huge learning process for me in terms of um, some of the fabrication elements. And all of this was not necessarily available to me when I was an undergrad. We did not have um, any kind of CNC cutting machines in the early 2000s. So um, in a way like being a sculptor is just like you're constantly teaching yourself new processes depending upon the project demands. Um, so my husband was a blacksmith in his 20s and he's also proved to be a very helpful assistant um and we cold bent all of these frames because in using any kind of heat it would warp the material and then ultimately the photographs wouldn't lie flat and so we went through a series of clamping embracing and then just like hammering the metal to um to make it lay in place in the way that i had um, imagined And by the end of this whole process, my studio is just a total disaster. Um, it takes a lot of matching up to um, try to coordinate where all of the um, important parts of the image or the unimportant parts of the image lie um, in the photographs to coordinate what's going to like bend out in the image um, or in the frame, sorry, um, and what's going to remain hidden. And so what you see on the left hand side upper left hand side is a lot of just the paper models of like the actual photographs and me kind of trying to calculate out where those bends would fall and what that would reveal about the image um so it's just like a lot of coordination between like the photograph and the material structure in order to um finish up these works so um you can kind of see on the bottom right the all the works all having been bent and they were ultimately powder coated um, to give them this really nice white durable coating because i wanted the frames to blend in with the wall a little bit so that those images advanced forward a little bit more so that's kind of a little bit of a view into my world and, um, and my process with this, this work and how it kind of everything led up to this moment. Um, thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sharon. Folks, if you have questions, please pop them into the chat. Um, so, a question that I enjoy asking artists, um, because it's different for everyone, is take us through a day in the studio with you. Tell us if you have any ritual that starts the day. When do you start? How do you start? What sets kind of the mood for making? Um, anything that is important to that? Just take us through a day in the studio with you. So that's a really interesting question because um, I've heard a lot of artists like start their day off sketching or yeah, like some sort of ritual. For me, like being brutally honest, it's just making sure they have a cup of coffee. Like I typically, I typically don't go to the studio until after lunch. Um, so I will like do a lot of my kind of just like life business in the mornings um, because then I don't feel like I'm breaking up my day in the studio by like breaking for lunch. Like I think actually lunch is one of my most like annoying meals because it like stops my production. So um, typically I have lunch and then I make myself a cup of coffee and then go to the studio. And quite frankly, it's that like cup of coffee that really like jump starts me. Um, and, you know, in terms of like what, what it looks like from there, 
there, it's, it is so different and varied depending on what, what point in the process I am in the work. I think um, in establishing some of the more like physical components, um, I work in a much more solitude in, in, in solitude. So like I'm doing a lot of looking and research and cutting and, um, and it's a kind of actually a very meditative process. I really enjoy that. Um, but then if I'm photographing, it can be a lot of coordination with, um, other people and, um, just elements in the photograph as well. So um, I'm like constantly kind of like just moving things over by an inch and I'm very much so particular. So um, that can kind of be a little bit of a like finicky process, but it's it's really like, it's kind of different every day. If I go into the studio and I don't know what I'm doing, it really actually just helps to like cut some shapes and, and fold some paper a little bit and work with something they don't feel so precious about. Um, so yeah, kind of in a way a non-answer. I don't, I don't have any one particular ritual besides just making sure that I'm well caffeinated. Perfect. So uh, in your work, you negotiate some really interesting intersections. One is um, this kind of ephemeral chance encounter through, you know, those slice of life moments and like where something is going to line up based on the designs that you've selected. Um, but on the flip side of that, there is an enormous amount of planning and iteration. Um, and so the, the, they feel so opposite, like really oil and water and, mm -hmm the the kind of culmination of your work is the combination of those two. And so I'm curious if you have any uh, thoughts for folks that are negotiating pathways through both of those aspects on how you have found uh, maybe a good a good path for mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, it's it kind of goes back to just the like interest in dualities, I think for me, you know, that that like, you know, that hyper planning, but then the like ephemeral, like something won't last. Um, I like those two to me feel very much so diametrically opposed. And so that ultimately is what interests me, you know, is like trying to challenge myself to bring those together. Um, and so, you know, in terms of like negotiating that, I think that it actually just ultimately takes like a lot of patience and, and, and perhaps like interest in creating that balance of like, you know, a lot of people talk about like part of the magic of art is like, you know, you put in so much labor, but like if you make it look effortless, there's something that actually feels a little bit like magical about it too um and so for me it's very much so like finding that that spot of like you know that that like in between spot and and like I said too it's just I mean there's just so much so much process of trial and error and tears and then joy and and you know and success so um you know, in terms of like advice, it's like, oh, you just have to be a really emotionally resilient <laughs> and accept that like you're, you know, when working with two different things, there's going to be so many failures before you reach that point where like you are going to feel like you've struck that balance and success. Uh, so we have a question. Your current works feature mostly objects and some parts of the human body. Um, do you think you'll play with faces? and in your current sculptural cutout frame so maybe mm -hmm. like talking talking a little bit about the importance of obscuring the face mm -hmm. and whether or not you'll see that in the future yeah no that's a great question um I think um you know certainly in that body of work um responding so much to the pandemic I was so interested in obscuring identity because we kind of had that experience um for several years and I like a little bit of that mystery. Right now, I am working on some digital collages that are still kind of obscuring identity a little bit. So there may be some like residual pandemic trauma that I'm still working through. Um, but I do think there's also something kind of like interesting, like placing emphasis on like 
limbs and um, how those you know, limbs are kind of like interacting with the world because um, it it just seems a little bit enigmatic you know um, I think once you start to reveal the identity of a person it maybe like sets it a little bit too much in reality um, and by kind of obscuring the identity a little bit it kind of helps maintain that mystery I think it also like, like helps open up the possibilities that it could be one of many people in that case it also like I think skirts the like you know the kind of like how photography pins down um something in in terms of a document and so I think I'm still able to like oh just avoid avoid pinning anything down too much by kind of continuing to omit the faces it'll happen one of these days like I, for a long time I said I'd never work in color and now here I am so it becomes an evolution at some point that I always do the things that I say I'm not going to do I feel you on that um so because you've mentioned it multiple times you don't like to be uh you know pinned into one thing so I'm curious uh, how are you evolving now? How is the work evolving now? Um, and what is next on the horizon? Yeah, um, so I am working on a book right now. Um, and the book has cutouts. Um, so revealing successive pages afterwards. And um, it also, it's, it's like a, basically a series of digital collages. Um, so it's, you always have to like give things name, right? Like it is a book, it's a zine, like, you know, whatever it's, it's a series of pages that are bound together. Um, but I, and I, I think that's okay to name it out of like simplicity sake of describing it, but I'm always trying to like push the boundaries of like, how do we interact with books or what do we expect from the pages? Um, so that it feels like it's not entirely within the like traditions of of a book too. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> we have a fun question. What's your favorite piece of trash that you found in Philly and why? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I love that question. Ah. Oh. You know, I have like, and I just had a whole archive like on my phone of all the photos that I took in Philly. Um, you know, like I, one that I'm just thinking of was like this like mattress. It was like a full mattress and it had spray painted on it, this like beautiful graffiti. Um, and, and it sat there for years. It was just like two blocks from my studio. It was like between the deli and my studio. So I passed it all the time. Um, so... I would say that that would probably be my favorite. Um, but that traffic cone that I saw is pretty high up there too. I think about that traffic cone a lot. Cause it's like, I always wonder like, why, why did someone like, you know, chop the top off and then cut it down lengthwise. And like, I think it was three or four spots and it kind of splayed open. Like, I love that kind of mystery um, in the objects that I always found. So I, I do miss that a lot about Philly. All right. Well, it has been um, such fun to watch people interact with the work, um, just like the images that you had. Mm -hmm. um, folks have to, you know, bend and, and peer in order to, and, and they recognize what they're doing. And, and it's been a real joy to get to see that. So um, I think this is a really great place for us to, to close out for today. Thank you again, Sharon, for the generosity of your time and talent. Um, thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Sharon Koblinger as a part of our programming for A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023. And a special thank you to our curators, Sora Kang and Matt Distel, the participating artists, as well as the Ohio Arts Council's board, Ohio legislature, and the governor who support the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.